The message you're about to listen to is a message from Apostle Eric Nyamiche, the chairman of the Church of Pentecost. Apostle Eric Nyamiche preaches the gospel in its simplest form to help the believers walk in Christ and also how the believer relate with his world. This year, the message is on unleashing the church to possess nation. Join us and let's learn from Apostle Eric Nyamiche and be a blessing to the world. If you are new to this page, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you can have access to it. Make sure you go to our own page and check out for more videos. Thank you. But I think that sometimes we need to take opportunity of situations like this and discuss about the dead, the dead in Christ. It is the road that we are all going to travel. And sometimes we shouldn't just come to church and preach other things without actually dwelling on the question of the dead. So I will spend some time talking about dead. And then we will pray together. Then I will ask leave of you. But I know that the Supreme Lord will work a work in the midst of all of us. And let it be that we shall take opportunity, this situation that has happened to us, let us turn it around for the good of this church. Hallelujah. The question of the dead is a difficult one. How human beings vanish from the planet Earth, never to be seen again, is mind-boggling. My own dad was very ill, very, very sick. We tried as we could, but we, we realized that he was deteriorating. As we kept praying, he was growing weaker and weaker. At a point, the doctors gave up on him. And I prayed a prayer that God, please let my old man go and rest. Then, he was still, God was not taking him away that quickly. One day I was at meal, and I remembered my dad. I thought I should call him and then follow up on his condition. When I called him, the way he was groaning, I couldn't come back and eat. But when he died, and they told me, I cried like a baby. You see, my own dad, but ever since he died, I've not set eyes on him anywhere. Not even in my dreams. And it is, it, it is, it is mind-boggling how human beings leave this earth never to be seen again. It's something that worries the human being. There are compounds of limitation on this planet earth. The natural disasters, how we have all these storms that carry buildings and human beings. They tend to happen. Earthquakes, natural disasters, suffering. As long as you're on planet Earth, know that you go through suffering. Suffering in various forms and shades. And the mother of all this predicament is death. And sometimes people think that religion is an escape mechanism from these compounds of limitation. And that if you join any religious group, then you get out of this, you don't get out of them. Jesus never promised us that we are not going to die or we are not going to have any trouble on the planet Earth, no. He says that on this earth, you have troubles, but know that I overcome. He never gave us that kind of thinking that it's going to be all rosy, no. That is why in the church, we have to try and learn how to sing songs about hope, about the future. When we don't do that and talk more about hope, issues like this have the potential to drive some of us out of our faith. Don't let us reserve these songs only for funerals. Da Yehovah ne ne ma. No, betra epo no. Ne, rusi beba Israel. Oh, Israel, and me betche. Hallelujah, da. No, na Israel, and me. Yeah. 
Standing and listening to me, the Bible says that there are three things that abide faith, hope, and love. But we come to church, we only talk about faith and sometimes about love. The hope is also important, it gives us the tenacity that brings that enduring spirit. As we stand here, and some of you are sitting, no problem. There are many things that are going on in our lives that you cannot even tell people. Some are marital challenges, others are issues of job. Sometimes there are certain sicknesses that you are not even able to tell even your, your doctor. He will ask you, but you are not able to tell him what is wrong with you. They are predicaments. They are compounds of limitation. But in the midst of all this, we are looking forward to a city whose maker and builder is God. Now, if it is in this life alone, that we have hope in Christ, then we are of all men most miserable. The apostle Paul said, then let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But you see, we have another world in view. It doesn't matter what happens to us. Our Savior has gone ahead. Shall we lift up our hands and begin to bless the name? <speaking in Spanish> Yeah, one you for free. So rap Bring to me in Tias. Bring to me. Tias. Yeah, couldn't Sunde <laughs> Bahan 
shall we take our seats and Please lift up your heads and then let's go on this journey. It overwhelms the mind, the question of the dead. Before its advancement in technology, science has not found solution to death. But will it ever find? I don't think so. Religion has neither. The white man dies, the black man dies, the colored dies. The rich man dies and the poor dies. The young passes on and the aged also is caught in death. You see, death renders all men equal. That is why Solomon says that looking at all this, he sees life in its totality as meaningless. The chasing after the wind. But it doesn't mean that when you have life to live, you just say that because I'm going to die, I'm not going to do anything. Do the best that you can. When the day comes for you to sit in your vehicle and the Lord takes us home, then you go and rest. God is not only the God of the living, He is also the God of the dead. The Bible says that when we are absent in the body, we are present with the Lord. He's not only the God of the living, he's also the God of the dead. For so far as Christ is concerned, there is no difference between the dead and the living. When we are alive, we belong to him. If we die, we are for him. So Paul says that therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. A friend of mine passed on. After about a week, I decided to visit the house. When I told the wife that I was coming around, he gathered all the children. Some of them are married with their spouses in the house. When I got there, there were, they, they were many. But that was the nuclear family. Then after the normal exchange of presentries, I told them my mission, the obvious one. They knew my relationship with the father. So they started crying. Then when they lifted their heads, two hands went up. They were going to ask me questions. When I listened to the first question, I understood where she was coming from. And I knew that if I answered, there was going to be some follow-up questions. They were going to ask me this question. Why all this in the face of a loving, omnipotent God? Let me just say that again. Why all this in the face of a loving God who is also omnipotent? Where was he? That is a question they want to ask me. But I don't have solution to that question. Because I also have my own questions. So when they asked the first one, I thought that I should wait for the second. Then the second one came, the third one came. And when I lifted my head, I told them that the Jesus people talk about, I'm not the Jesus. I'm just like them. We all have questions, but we know that one day he wiped away our tears and then we understand all these things by and by. When we get there, the other person, one of the boys said, Apostle, you also have questions. I, said, I also have questions. Then this one left where he was sitting. He came to sit close by me. And as I started trying to uh, encourage them, he kept looking at my face like that. 
He was surprised that I also have questions. <laughs> Listen, we all have questions. But you see, it is better to look at hope and what has been given than to be asking why, why, why. You may never get to the bottom of it. You will not. The secret things, according to scripture, belongs to the Lord. Then when things like this happen, the will of God concerning us is to th say thank you. Thank you means full stop. And then you move on with life. Because still life is there for you to live. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So we don't have answers to all. So don't disturb your soul with many questions. You may not get the answers. But just have faith in God. He who has said that he will come back again, certainly he will be with us. I couldn't answer those questions. A friend of mine also passed on. I went to the funeral and the wife was reading the, the tribute to the husband. And when the wife was reading the tribute, she read something like this and I underlined. I know that you are God. You never make mistakes. But even if you make mistakes, who can question you? Then I underline it. I was not understanding it well. So I underline it because he said, you are the Lord who never make mistakes. That one is true. But she didn't end there. She went on to say that even if you make a mistake, who can question you? I underlined it. Because what is this? If the Lord does not make mistakes, fine. But she said that even if you make a mistake, so in her mind, so far as the husband's death is concerned, she is thinking that mm, maybe. Do you understand what he is trying to say? Then I underlined it. This is when reality challenges your faith. Can I say that again? This is when reality challenges your very faith. And in situations like that, it is dangerous because you can abandon the faith. You can abandon the faith. So that was from her. But I learned something from an elderly woman. The husband passed on. And then, after about three months, she, she came to my house to pay me a visit. And when she got there, she told me another story. That just after the husband has been buried, his son also died. And so she went to the hometown and to bury the son. So she's just returning from the hometown, and she thought that she should pass by the mission house and just to inform me that she's back. I said, oh, because I know that. She's alone with the husband, and now the husband is gone. So I asked her, so how are you now going to cope? Then this old lady looked at my face, and she said, I have learned to accommodate every condition. That phrase she used is, is in the Bible. Messiah said, is in the Bible. So I was like, ah, who am I talking to? Then I asked her, so, ah, so you just you lost this young man too, just after your husband uh, left you. So what happened at the funeral? And then she looked at my face. And she said, but apostle, we have been told. They have told us. So I realized that I was speaking to somebody whose death in the things of God is very deep. So, hey, yeah, I have learned. But you see, we have also been told. So maybe let me go back and then retell what the Apostle Paul said concerning death. 
so that we all know that we have been told. So that when it strikes like this, we take it easy. And then we look forward to the future. We have been told. The Bible teaches on death. The church in Corinth has a lot to teach us. So we are not the first group of people who are serving God. The Abrahams and all were servers of God. They actually served him. So we have a Bible, which is a scripture, that teaches us as to how God dealt with human beings in good times and in difficult times. And the church of Corinth teaches us a lot of lessons. This was a church that had a lot of giftings amongst them. And sometimes they even prided in those giftings to a fault. The apostle Paul had to come around and then teach them as to how to use their gifts. But in the midst of the gift of healing, in the midst of the gift of faith, in the midst of the gift of the working of miracles, people still died in the church. And then, worst of all, there were some group of brethren who have infiltrated their ranks and teaching a certain theology of no bodily resurrection. Now, if there is no resurrection, it renders our faith of non-effect. It is, a resur- it is in the resurrection that we have hope in Christ. And if there is some people are teaching that there is no resurrection, then they were actually doing great damage to the church. So when the apostle Paul heard it, he decided that he would write a letter and then dwell on this issue of death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want us to go to 1 Corinthians 15. From verse 1, please. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. What is that word? The next one? Amen. You realize that if it is a condition. So we are saved by the gospel. But what is the gospel? Then I'll come back to this. You, if you hold firmly to the word I, what? Otherwise, you have believed in vain. We don't want to believe in vain. And now he's coming to talk about what it means by the gospel. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. When we are talking about the gospel, this is the gospel. The gospel is simple that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day. So, whosoever believes, This is the gospel. And he says that when you receive this gospel, you are saved. But hold on to it. Otherwise, you may lose the faith. What is threatening them? What is threatening their faith was this teaching of no resurrection. And that is dangerous. If we take that one away, Christianity has no value. So he says that hold on, if, if. But if you don't hold on, certain things can disturb you. This is the the opening statement of 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at the conclusion. I will preach from the conclusion, not the, the introduction. Let's look at the conclusion. Verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, after he has explained to them what it means by death, the resurrection, and all that. What is the word there? Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is the conclusion. He's saying that, therefore, my brother, stand firm. Let nothing move you. What is the meaning of that? In other words, something can move you. The contest was death. When he thinks that something can move you, he's only saying that if you don't take care, death, the pain of it, 
the shock of it can move you from your feet. So say, therefore, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing. If he says, let nothing move you, it means that something can move you. In this life, things move people. Something can move you. So I'll come back to let nothing move you. But the greatest portion of 1 Corinthians 15 is from verse 12. Do you know that when Jesus died and some women came to tell the disciples that his body was not found, some of the disciples decided that it was all over and that they were going back to their village. They decided to leave Jerusalem and go back to their village in Mouse. It was when they were on their way that Jesus joined them. And he started asking them, what, what is the trouble? What is the issue? Are you the only person who, the stranger in Jerusalem? Haven't you heard? And then they told Jesus, the resurrected Christ, the story about himself. And they said that we had hope. We had hope that he was going to be our deliverer. But the woman came this morning with a story that is not found in the tomb. And worst of all, they said that their body was not there. Those days, stealing bodies in the tomb was normal. And so when they said their body was not there, they said, ah, everything is, is finished. Then let us go back to our village. But today I want to encourage you. It is, it is not finished yet. The resurrected Christ is still with us. And our brother will rise again. He is still with us. So don't lose hope. Let's go to from verse 12 now. From verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? This is the problem with the apostle Paul. So how can some of you say, if we are preaching that Christ was raised from the dead, how can some of you preach that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. So is your faith. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. So is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then, those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. But if Christ has been raised, then they are not lost. That is what he's trying to say. Can we read verse 19 together? If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But let's add a verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. From verse 20, he then talks about Christ has been raised. And then he decided to talk about how the resurrection is going to take place. He says that it's going to be in order. He said the first is Christ. The second is when he appears. He will shout and those who by that time are Christians and are not dead will be caught up to meet him. That is the second order. Then... Later on, all the dead will rise again. Now, listen, when we are talking about the dead will rise again, we are not just talking about believers. Everybody will be adversary. <laughs> there was this pastor preaching at a funeral. And he was saying that the dead in Christ will rise again. The dead will rise again. I said, my brother, let them know that those who are also not believers, they will also rise. Otherwise, the thing is not balanced. If you do all that you have to do, you spite God, you disobey him, and you die and you don't rise to judgment, then what is the need for us rising? 
then we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. So the resurrection is for both believers and non-believers. All will rise again. But some to damnation, some to eternal glory. And I'll be part of that. And I know you are also going to be part of that. All will rise again. It's going to be in order. He spoke about the order. He went on to say from verse 30 coming that if Christ was not raised and we are not going to be resurrected, then what is the use for me fighting with human beings who were like beasts in Ephesus? Why am I worrying myself so much for the kingdom of God? Then he says that if we are not going to rise, then let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But that is not it. He says that we will rise again. Then he touched the very crux of the matter. If we will rise again, how? Have you thought about that before? Let's say we will rise again. But how? Because you see a human being die motionless. The person is gone, he is buried. He, the person decomposes many years. Then he said, how are we going to rise again to come into this body? Then the apostle Paul says that, let me give you some analogy. It's just like a grain in your hand, a dent of maize. He says that when you are going to plant it in the belly of the earth, what will come out is not like what you planted. This is Paul. He says that we are not planting what will eventually come out. We are planting that which will die. And then what will come out, the color, the nature, is so different from the grain of maize. So that is what is going to happen to us. And Jesus gave us an example. He rose again in the body. See my hands, see my side. He entered rooms without knocking. He didn't need that. That body is called the celestial body. And brothers and sisters, when we see him, we will be just like him. We will carry this body to one day. We shall have a resurrected body. But it's not like this one that we are going to bury. And this is a sign This one, no matter what you do to it. No matter what. You see, sometimes <laughs> I've, I've met, I met some old lady. She shocked me. When I was still a teenager Christian, she met me. She says, Me ba. Can be so bon pie, mammy. She said, Oh, nana me mon pie, dang pie. Ka bon pie, mammy, and anka ja. Ka me ko. O ko hi. Then she said that all my friends are gone. I'm the only person. You see, life. You see how meaningless that thing is? I was shocked. That time I was a teenager. And I didn't even want to discuss death. No, 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 no. But here is the old lady. No matter what she, is, she, she does to the body, this body, as you grow, you find out that no, living in this body is worrisome. You want to check out. Brothers, one day, we shall have a better body. It will not die any longer. It wouldn't need to go to hospital for any checkups. Yeah. And we shall be with the Lord. My presiding elder, an old man, many years preached this, a sermon. He, he wouldn't preach as long as we do. Uh, but you see, he would just preach like five minutes and you finish preaching. But what he does is to laugh about 15 minutes into the five minutes of the word. Every statement you make, you just pull up the trousers like this and laugh. And then one of those days, he came around. He says that, <laughs> praise the Lord, and we shout hallelujah. Then he was pulling up the trousers. He says that people say that when we go to heaven, <laughs> then you pull up the trousers. That he will laugh and all of us will have the, all the patience to wait for him. He will laugh and laugh. He says that there's going to be 12 gates. Then he will stand there quietly. You see, as for me, I don't care whether there are 12 gates. And then he says, hey! 
Even they said that we are going to walk on gold. <laughs> hey, gold. And then he would just move from the 12 gates, come to the gold. And then we will all be laughing. But he has the kabod. He has weight in his spirit. When he's preaching, you feel the weight. And then he landed and said this. He said, me, I don't care. Whether there are 12 gates or we walk on gold. What I know is this. That Jesus says that where he is, there shall the servants be. Now, so me, I'm working very hard to go to where Jesus is. When I get to where he is, and the gates are not 12, me, I don't care. <laughs> you see, as he has preached, once he gets to where Jesus is, whether it is gold or all that he wants is to get to where Jesus is. We used to sing this song. Someday, someday, I'll go where Jesus is. Someday, someday, I'll go where Jesus is. Someday, someday, I'll go where Jesus is. I'll be caught up to meet him caught up to meet him I'll be caught up to meet him in the air someday we will go where Jesus is we would have gone away from all these human limitations and predicament and we shall go where he is let us look forward to that day let us worship him with all our strength if we can now let me just bring the conclusion by reading the last verse. Let's go to verse 58. But do you know what is written in 1 Corinthians 15, 46? Bring 46. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. Move on. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man from heaven. Move on. As, as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. As, and as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. 49. Just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the heavenly man. Verse 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the perishable. Once you are born again and you bear this earthly body, have the confidence that you bear the heavenly one too. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Verse 58. Shall we read together? Therefore, stand firm, let nothing move you, because, amen. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully. It doesn't matter what is going to happen to you. To the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in, it's not in vain. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Be steadfast or moveable. Be fixed in direction. Don't let nothing move you. Don't be unwavering in your faith. Be firm in your purpose. And be resolute in your faith that you are for Christ, and that one is enough. Certain things can move you. See, in this life, bad things happen to good people. What did I say? In this life, bad things happen to good people. 
Don't think that because you are good, nothing bad will happen to you. This was the theology of the friends of Job and their wife. So when things were happening to Job that were negative, people were asking, have you done anything wrong? Job, search. Job, search. Job said, I have sought. I have not done anything against God. He said, Job, search. Because what is happening to you simply means that maybe Job, search. And Job said that, okay. I don't know where I can find God. If I knew where I can find him, I would have gone to him and asked him, what have I done against you? You know my heart. And then he says that if they tell you that he's in the north and you decide to go to the north, by the time you get to the north, they will tell you that didn't you meet him? He's gone to the south. And by the time you get to the south, he said, that, ah, you, two, you didn't see God? He says that if only I can find him, I will ask him my questions. Sometimes it's like that. But you see, God knew what was happening. But the people around him didn't understand. When he lifted up his hands and said, to God be the glory, the wife said, what? What are you doing? Are you still worshiping God? Curse him and die. And Job said, no. You are speaking like one of these women. When we had plenty, we praised the Lord. Now when there is evil, he said, I should curse God and die. He said, no, I wouldn't do that. But in life, bad things happen to good people. We were in the Republic of South Africa. When I just got there as a missionary, I heard this story of a deacon and a deaconess who lost a child. The two of them have been brought from Adisada College to university in South Africa. And the first week when they went to school, they joined their colleagues to the beach. They were standing at the shore, not... Uh, swimming. And then the story said that some wave came and collected the boy. He was the firstborn and left a sister standing there. And this boy was never found. They found him later, he was dead. He was not swimming. The man was so devastated. What is this? What have I done, God? Bad things happen to good people. About four years later, a man is an architect, and this second boy has also trained to be an architect. He had completed school, and because of the boy, the man felt that, let me just uh, run up and go back home to Ghana. I'm tired here in South Africa. Because he will hand over all his works to this architect, and then he can then go home. At least he will know that his boy is continuing the work, and he is assured of his income too. This boy finished school. Month two, three months later, he fell ill, but I left South Africa and came to Ghana for cancer meeting. When we closed the cancer meeting at the airport, the mother called that, ah, also for, I don't know what is happening to my boy. And then he, he, I sensed that there was some kind of stress in her voice. So I told her that we are about boarding. We will soon land and we'll go and pray and see this young man. Before I could land, the boy had died. So when I got home, the elders came to me because we needed to break the news to the man. Because the woman took the boy to Johannesburg. That was about 1,000 kilometers from where we were. And so the man was in Amtata, and then the woman and the, and the, the young man uh, went to Johannesburg. So the news came to one elder and then to me when I just landed at Johannesburg. So when we rushed home, we decided that we were going to break the news to this man. 
in our discussion, we wanted to find out who was bold enough to, to break the news. So the presiding elder was an elderly man. So we thought that he could do that. So I decided that presiding, I think you can do that for us. Then he looked at me. He nodded that he would do it. But he changed his mind before we left the, <laughs> my, the mission house. See, sometimes things are tough. He changed his mind. And so we had to sit down again and then look for who will be able to do that. Then this elder decided that he would try. My house and this Dickens house is just one house away. There's just a house between the two of us. And so we just walked to his gate. He got to his gate. This elder also changed his mind. <laughs> you can see the, 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 the magnitude of the challenge. He changed his mind. And he didn't just change his mind. He started weeping at the gate. I said, oh, in this life. So then, I had to do it myself. Because, of course, you are the pastor. So we rang the bell for him to come and open us. Then when he heard the bell, he stood in front of the house and shouted, Is my son still alive? And none of us could answer. And we didn't press the bell again. Is my son still alive? We're all there. We didn't have anyone to respond. So he came. Then when he opened the gate and he saw us, he left us and started weeping. We had to chase him, sat him down, and then try to see if God will minister to him. Bad things happen to good people. In that church that we had, this Dickin, I think that he was the best of men. Very, very honest man. Great supporter of the church. And these things were happening to him. After a while, the wife went to preach in a certain local assembly. Then the presiding elder called me. That today something has really shocked him. I said, what? So the way the woman was preaching. The kind of things she was sharing was so much encouraging to everyone in the room. Because that kind of experience has also given her something to say to people who are going through such kind of trials. But I want to say that in this life, bad things happen to good people. Don't think that because you are good, nothing bad will happen to you. It is, it is a wrong theology. Second thing that can move you is that disappointment is a major fact of life. Sometimes you are expecting something from someone, but you will not get it. We are expecting a lot from Mark because he was full of life. But here we are, very much disappointed. But it's, it's a fact of life, disappointment. Things happen in this life. This is Emma Ufia, Yana Unim the Ecos. I know a member of this church. She married within four days, the husband died. Can you imagine that? You marry today, one, two, three, four days, the spouse dies. I didn't know anything has happened to something that happened to this lady. But in 1997, we went for a youth conference, and she was to save us. She came to where I was. She brought the food in the company of some other ladies. But as I looked at her, she seems to be someone who doesn't have a soul. I was wondering, who is this person? She's like a ghost in my eyes, the way I perceived her. So I asked the organizer, the one who brought me to the camp, that what about this lady? What, what, uh, is she okay? Then the man said, I will tell you her story. The thing that happened not long ago, four days after marrying, the husband dies. 
Disappointment is a major fact of life. But does it mean that we are disappointed so we don't move on? The last one that I want to say and we'll pray is this. The world is not fair. If you are seeing it, your brain know the, the world is not fair at all. But in the midst of all these compounds of limitation, there is an oasis of salvation, which is in Jesus Christ. We are not going to have everything go on, Rosie, with us. It is never going to happen. So no matter what happens, let us remember that he is still with us. Peace is not the absence of war. It is when he is with us in times like this. Shall we rise to our feet?